being on the other side, it was very empowering because it was our world. In fact, later when it started going more straight, when it became more acceptable to be gay and, and the straight started going to the gay bars because yeah. of the music and stuff, I started a um, kind of a riot one night. I um, had some uh, flyers printed up, said this is a gay bar, straight men out. And I gave them out to all of my friends. And at a certain point that night, when uh, a song was playing, I told them, throw these all over the place. Um, and we did. And as soon as that happened, of course, it was a big fight. Yeah. So the other side closed down that night. Um, and that was the beginning of the end, actually, of the other side, because it eventually ended up going straight. But you said a lot of like touring musicians would come, like the Stones oh, yeah. and Bowie and all those. David guys. Bowie came. Um, the New York Dolls were there a lot. Yeah. Uh, they loved the Queens. David Bowie too, I think, was talking to one of them. Um, David, I remember David Bowie. I remember New York Dolls a lot. The Rolling Stones came in. Yeah, if anybody, and they did. They all played Boston because they played at the. Um, where did we used to sneak in there? Um, it's still there. They all used to play at the one place, JoJo Gunn, who nobody knows about now. I, I, we were, me, Jolene and I were uh, groupies for them. They didn't do anything with us, but um, on the stage, um, yeah, they'd all come in and they'd be superstars and they'd sit. And, um, but everybody that came into Boston came to the other side because the other side was the only. This was before 1270. Right. And 1270 never had that kind of um, ambiance that the other side had. The other side was really dark and really crowded. Well, 1270 was crowded. But it was, um, 1270 was later when it all became acceptable. The early days, around 73, 74, it started changing. But before then, it was very much us and them. Mm -hmm. So you were empowered inside the other side because it was, this was your place, and it was the only place that was yours. Now, the, when Sylvia said that it was such a lonely life, everything seemed so happy, it was such a lonely life, it, I find that this sort of always seems to be a bit of a contradiction a little bit to me because the gay bars were like a, a sanctuary and an oasis that made it seem less so. Right? I mean, that was where you actually ended up sort of finding a different family. Sure, that was my family. Right, so I mean, that's sort of, I mean, it doesn't but sound as... But once the bar closed, you were back in reality. Yeah. I mean, you got to remember, I was chased down the street by groups of guys with bats and yeah. my fucking platforms and stuff. Right. Geraldine and I were chased by under, undercover cops for no reason at all. And we ran for no reason at all. And um, But you didn't feel lonely when you were there. Well, you couldn't. You were fucked up. And you were always high, for first of all. But even then, it was about... It was really lonely because the whole time you were there, you were looking for somebody to go home with. You were mm -hmm. looking for somebody to love. You were looking for somebody to connect with. And that wasn't very likely to happen then because everything was so open and so free and we were all so fucked up and stuff. How are you going to be committed to anybody or anything like that? So... While you were in the club, it was great, it was fun, and everybody was, but as soon as you left that bar, even standing outside in the front, and where they were hanging out afterwards, a lot of people and stuff, there'd be cars going by with groups of guys, you know, you fucking faggots, and the mm -hmm. cops would be coming by and making everybody go with their billy clubs and everything. Mm -hmm. Jobs, um, I wouldn't get hired a lot because I was too obviously gay, right. and, you know, and I wasn't going to... Um, and, and we were also really radical about it, it, it you know, for, for, for being in the closet and for being so dirty and filthy, it was like, fuck you. In fact, I got fired from, um, uh, me and Geraldine got a job at, at uh, said insurance, uh, John Hancock, taking out staplers in the basement. And I, one, day, one day I just told the guy to kiss my gay ass, gay ass, and, and so I was fired, of course. But it was very much... In the early days, it was still very much us against them. Yeah. Around 73 or 74, that started changing, and the gay life started changing. For the better? No. Um, where it was a family at one time, it started splintering up, and, and everybody was every. It splintered up where all of a sudden some of the drag kings were going butch and were having the hankies in their, in their things and their work boots and stuff, and they stopped coming, and they would start going to a different bar. Um, and 
And so the other side, that's why the other side ended up basically going straight and then closing eventually because a lot of those drag queens moved on. They weren't drag queens anymore and 1270 started becoming and you had a different kind of group there. Then you had the leather bars. So it started to get more fragmented. It started becoming more fragmented and it started becoming less of a family and more of a, if you're not like we are, then you're not accepted. And this this wasn't how it was in the in the and that's originally uh, eventually why I got out of the gay lifestyle. I was still a homo, right. but I wouldn't label myself as gay anymore because there came a time where you were gay first and a person second, and I was never going to do that. I was Robert. My being gay was just a part of who I was, right. but it became like all encompassing um, to the community. I mean, it had we had to be in the beginning because we needed safety in numbers. Right. It didn't. You didn't need safety in numbers. Eventually, it didn't. It wasn't about that anymore. But it still was kind of. So I kind of stepped away for a while. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the drugs and the culture as it relates to the music because you became a DJ yourself when you moved to New York. Do you have any early thoughts or I mean or memories or thoughts about how the drugs impacted the, the the music that was being played or how people experienced it or how it helped disco evolve or any of that kind of stuff. Well, the drugs changed once disco came in and started evolving and then coke came in. So it kind of went from the downs, um, it changed. So what was the music like when it was downs? Like what, what? It was, it was, it was all up tempo. It was yeah. all, um, you all the one, it was all pre-disco stuff. It was, um, uh, the jungle fever. The tramps were like the beginning of disco. That was like before right. disco, but they were the first, for me, they were the, like the first taste of disco and Barry White, Barabbas, stuff right. like Barabbas, but Barabbas was European, and they were more still on that kind of rock thing. Um, I mean, it was, it was dis it became a disco kind of thing, but originally it was, some of the clubs wouldn't play it because it was a little too rockish. Um, but in those days you had to, there was no disco, so you had to make do, like they would play, they, Jay Giles, Give It To Me would be played. Um, Rolling Stones, right. a lot of Motown, but the drugs then were definitely mostly Downs um, and Black Beauties. We'd mix them too, but even yeah, they it, actually it sped up a lot. Um, Euro disco came in and stuff later and stuff with the Coke. Right. So it actually did change, even though it was still up tempo in the early days, but it was more. It was more down and dirty. It was more stacks records rather than Euro disco. Um, so we, like we were down and dirty, and the dancers were down and dirty, like the bump. Right. The bump was the big dance. Thing. Yeah, you mentioned I think here you mentioned briefly in, the, in, the, in the, your biography about the, the, the bump being how dirty it really was. It was sex. It was. I mean, you'd have th threesomes bumping each other, and you'd be humping them, and you'd be all on the beat. Um, but you'd be down on the ground and be somebody over you like this and shit. Um, it was, it, and the whole, this is why I would love to make a movie of this because yeah. you, you'd walk in to the other side and Jungle Fever would be playing, which was all dum 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 dum, and everybody's like boom, yeah. boom, and everybody's fucked up. So you're like, ah. you know, it, so when you're fucked up like that and you have this really jungly sexual, um, and you're separate from the rest of the world and stuff, and it's hot and it's smoky and it's in, it just becomes like a, a like a huge orgy. I mean, it, it, there was sexual stuff going on there too, you yeah. know. But um, and there actually there was a New York too later with disco. It actually right. became much more. There were there were orgy rooms. Yeah, I mean, I guess that my, I'm always kind of fascinated by the role that drugs played in, in dance music only because I wonder if the dance music separated from the drugs can stand on its own or was the well, evolution look, of it. Look today, I mean, look, at, I haven't been to a bar today, but everything is so, like, clean and stuff and bright and, and there's no smoke and it's so weird now. In those days, it was primal. It was very primal. and. When you walked out of a bar, when you walked, even 1270, uh, still at that time, but the other side, when you walked out at the end of the night, you were fucking exhausted. You had been 
high, you had been down, you had been dancing all night, you had been hot and sweaty, you had been kissing, you had been whatever the hell you were doing. Um, and then after you'd go out to eat at Ken's or something and fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it's, so it's almost as if though gay bars then served a very different function than they do now. Completely. I mean, yeah. It was, it was, and, and the guys that opened them knew this. The mafia, that's why the mafia was so involved in this, because they knew that this, this was the only place that we could go and be ourselves, where you could walk in that door and let everything go, and it was real, and that's why it was all really Mary this and Miss Thing and pss, pss, and uh, it was, we everybody, we had our own language, we had, I didn't really do too much of that, but. Um, it, you had your own language, you had your own everything. Um, you were totally unique, and we were above it all while we were in the other side. And the Mafia were good little capitalists and they exploited it, right? I mean, they, they saw And they let us alone. Yeah. And as long as they made their money and we didn't bring the cops, they basically let us the fuck alone. Nobody ever bothered us except to try to pick us up. Right. Uh, the doormen were always trying to, in fact, I was over there, I, I, I don't remember if I had sex with them, but I remember being over their houses and stuff, so I must have done something with them. They were all gay or bi. Um, they all had boys all the time. Young, that's why we got in. That's why if you were 13, 14, 15, you'd get into the other side because... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing to me because there was no real sense of a legal age to get into some of these places back then. Nobody seemed to even really bat an eyelash about Well, you got to remember also they changed legal age to 18 from 21. For a little while, they have the right. drinking age. Right. So during the other side, this this changed. Um, so that made it even more like okay, eighteen, no big deal. Fifteen's close enough. Yeah. 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 But they paid off the cops, yeah. so that's why we were there. Mm -hmm. We couldn't go into the places. That, we couldn't go into twelve seventy. They because parted. it was a different kind of thing at twelve seventy. They parted more strictly there. They were much more strict there, and it wasn't boys, and it wasn't hooker. You got to remember that what part of the business of the other side was the hookers, the prostitutes, the the pimps. There right. was money there. You got the the people buying drinks, and you couldn't stay in the other side unless you bought drinks. Sally would come around to say, "Honey, you got to buy a drink, or you got to go." Now, is this Sally or uh, also Tex? Is Te Tex? It was Tex. Okay. Sally was, I think, in New York. Right. <laughs> so it was Tex that I remember reading about Tex. here too. That Tex would tell you you had to leave if you could. Everybody remembers Tex. Now tell me about Tex a little bit because I only remember Tex from, and I think uh, uh, from Bobby's actually. She was still serving drinks at Bobby's on Canal Street as late as 89, 1990. She was a little tiny old wow. thing navigating that crowd of like hundreds of people with a tray. She seemed about 50 years old. She had these tight curls, blonde. She was motherly, but. Business, all business still. I mean, she was like a kind of like a den mother in a way, but she was all business. You know, she was there to make money and she was there to make money for them. I don't know what she had going with them. Maybe she was family or something. I don't really know. But she was the only person like that there. Everybody else was gay, mainly Queenie, the, the, the waiters and waitresses then. Uh, I knew the waiters, but I didn't know the bartenders because I didn't drink. So I'd right. hang over there. And I was 15. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to dance and pick up, have sex. Um, so the only, I mean, there was very little conversation with her or anything. She didn't hang out with us. Mm -hmm. But she... Did she look out for people sometimes? Or was she not, she was too more detached than that? She was more detached. I mean... She, she, I don't remember any particular kindnesses from her, but I don't, but she certainly was, you got to remember in 71, if you weren't judgmental, you were, we loved you, you know, if you didn't hate a faggot, if you accepted me, you were okay in our book, and that was, that was her, right. that was Tex, um, she was always there, um, and she always had the money wrapped around her finger, I remember, the, actually all of the fingers, they all had the money wrapped around dollar bills, so, <laughs> um, so I, maybe the queens had more to do with her um, because a lot of the queens were our age too and were really young and stuff, um, but they were kind of above everything. No, I, I personally never had a lot, of, a lot to do with Tex and I don't remember her particularly being uh, motherly or anything. 
she accepted us. Okay. So in that sense, she was kind of like a den mother. Um, you you got to remember, in, in, at that time, it was still very much the boys in the band. Gay life was the boys in the band. Right. Um, and that's what the other side was about, basically. Right. And, and Tex was the only woman there, straight woman there, um, that worked there and stuff. There were fag hags. Yeah. We all had our fag hags. Right. Um, but she was the only straight woman, she was the only woman, I think, that ever worked at the other side.